In the bending flexural test, a specimen is loaded under uniaxial bending stress in order to obtain information on the bending behavior of materials. Especially brittle materials such as cemented carbides, tool steels, and gray cast iron are tested in flexural tests. This is then used to determine, for example, the flexural strength, the deflection at fracture, and the modulus of elasticity. A standardized specimen is placed on two supports in the testing machine. Flat specimens with a rectangular cross-section or round specimens with a circular cross-section are usually used. The specimen is then bent with increasing force by a centrally located loading fin. Due to the three contact points on the specimen, this test arrangement is also referred to as a three-point bending flexural test. The bending load is greatest at the point of maximum deflection, which is the middle of the specimen length. The greatest torque is present there at all times. In the case of a bending load, this torque is also referred to as bending moment. Starting from the center of the specimen, the bending moment decreases linearly up to the two supports. The diagram shows the course of the bending moment and the shear force over the entire specimen length. The greatest bending moment at the point of maximum deflection can be determined using the following procedure. First, we take a closer look at the acting forces. Due to the symmetrical arrangement, the two supports each absorb half of the bending force of the loading fin. Now we consider the specimen at the point of maximum deflection isolated from its surroundings in order to determine the bending moment at this point. The torque is generally determined by the product of the force and the lever arm. In this case, the force corresponds to the force of the support or half of the bending force. The lever arm is equal to half the span of the two supports. In this way, we finally obtain the shown formula for calculating the maximum bending moment. This is only dependent on the bending force and the distance between the supports. This bending moment causes the material to be stretched on the outside and compressed on the inside of the curvature. As a result, the material is subjected to compressive stress on the inside and tensile stress on the outside. The stress values are highest at the surface layer of the material due to the maximum compression or strain. The stresses decrease inwards in each case. Within the elastic limit and especially when Hooke's law is obeyed, this results in a linear stress distribution. The material remains unstressed at the transition from tensile to compressive stress. This characterizes the so-called neutral axis. For materials that react equally to tensile and compressive stress, the neutral axis runs through the geometric center of gravity of the specimen cross-section. In this case, the tensile and compressive stresses are distributed identically over the cross-section. The stresses occurring at the surface are decisive for material failure under bending stress, since the highest stress values are present there. These maximum stresses are referred to as flexural stresses sigma f. Compared to the tensile or compression test, in which the stresses in the material are homogeneously distributed over the specimen cross-section, in the flexural test there is an inhomogeneous stress distribution in the material. It can therefore be assumed that different limit stresses apply to a material in a bending test than in a tensile or compression test. In order to be able to define limit values for the flexural stresses, these must first be described mathematically on the basis of the external bending moment. We will go into this in more detail in the following. As already explained, the external bending moment causes a linear stress distribution across the material cross-section. In static equilibrium, the internal stress distribution in turn generates a torque that balances the external bending moment. Using this equilibrium and assuming a linear stress distribution, a relationship can be established between the acting bending moment MB and the stress sigma resulting at a distance Z from the neutral axis. The influence of the cross-section geometry on the stress distribution is taken into account by the so-called area moment of inertia I, which is also referred to as second moment of area. For a rectangular cross-section, the area moment of inertia depends only on the height and the width. For a circular cross-section, the second moment of area is determined by the diameter only. Note that the equation describing the stress distribution is only valid if the strains caused in the elastic range are proportional to the induced stresses, resulting in a linear stress distribution in the cross-section. This is also referred to as the linear elastic range. In particular, this means that it is assumed that Hooke's law is obeyed. Whether this assumption is always justified will be discussed later. The flexural stresses sigma f occurring at the material surface can now be determined with the derived bending equation. The distance z is equal to half of the total height of the cross-section. The quotient of twice the value of the second area moment and the thickness of the sample is referred to as section modulus, which is also a geometric parameter. 
For a rectangular or a circular cross-section, the section modulus is determined using the shown formulas. Finally, with the given formulas, the flexural stress can now be determined by the section modulus of the cross-sectional area as a function of the applied bending moment. Note again that the formula for calculating the flexural stress is only valid in the linear elastic range, since the section modulus is based on a linear stress distribution. With this mathematical determination of the flexural stresses, limit values can now be specified in the flexural test which must not be exceeded. We will discuss this in more detail in the following. As long as the flexural stress is below the limit of plastic deformation, the specimen is subjected to purely elastic loading. As the load increases steadily, the critical stress is first exceeded in the area of the surface. This corresponds to exceeding the yield point. Then, there will be a plastic deformation in the surface layers. This plastic deformation is also called flowing. In contrast to the elastically stressed areas, the stress distribution in the plastic deformation area is no longer linear. The areas further inside the material are theoretically subjected to purely elastic deformation. However, if the deformation near the surface is still present after the force is removed, then the supposed elastic deformation remains in the inner region as well. Residual stresses are the result, which we will discuss in more detail later. The limit up to which ductile materials can be stressed at a given bending load without permanent deformations in the edge area is called flexural yield point sigma Fy. This yield point for bending is determined by the previously derived formula using the bending moment MBY at the onset of plastic deformation and the section modulus SM of the specimen cross-section. To determine the onset of plastic deformation, the deflection is measured as a function of the applied force and recorded in a deflection force diagram. Force and deflection are determined directly on the testing machine. The deflection is the vertical distance of the deformed specimen and thus corresponds to the travel of the loading fin. Usually, the deflection is specified in the unit millimeter. At the beginning of the measurement, there is a proportional relationship between the applied force and the resulting deflection. Only elastic deformations occur in this elastic range. When the elastic limit is exceeded, the curve flattens out as in the stress-strain diagram of the tensile test, and indicates the yield force. With this yield force the induced bending moment can be determined at the onset of plastic deformation and thus the flexural yield point can be calculated. However, a yield point phenomenon as observed in the tensile test, which means a brief drop in force after the onset of plastic deformation, is usually not obtained in the deflection force diagram of the flexural test. Due to the linear stress distribution in the specimen cross-section, the areas further inside the material are not involved at once in the flow process, but gradually with increasing deflection. Thus, it is not a sudden onset of the flow process across the entire cross-section, but a gradual involvement. This also leads to the fact that the flexural yield point is usually about 10-20% to higher than the yield point obtained in the tensile test. If the tensile yield point is exceeded at the surface of the material, the areas that are still purely elastically stressed further inside lead to an obstruction of the plastic deformation. The flow process therefore begins at higher stress values than the tensile test suggests. For materials that do not show any obvious yield points in the diagram, a 0.2% flexural offset yield point sigma Fy 0.2 can be defined analog to the 0.2% offset yield point of the tensile test. Such a offset yield point is also calculated with the previously derived bending equation although there is no longer a linear stress distribution and therefore this equation is actually no longer valid. Thus, the flexural offset yield strength is a fictitious stress value which does not correspond to the actual stress. We will go into this in more detail later. In the given formula, MBY 0.2 denotes the bending moment at which a permanent deformation of 0.2% occurs at the point subjected to the highest stress. This permanent deformation therefore refers to the material surface at the point of maximum bending moment. This surface strain is also referred to as flexural strain epsilon f. The flexural strain is directly proportional to the deflection and can be determined using the shown formula. In this formula, d is the thickness of the specimen, l the distance between the supports and f the deflection. With tough materials, the specimen can be plastically deformed beyond the flexural offset yield point as the load increases but the specimen does not break. The specimen would only be pulled through the two supporting pins. For tough materials, the flexural test is therefore terminated when the flexural yield point has been exceeded. Compared to ductile materials, brittle samples usually show a different behavior in flexural tests. 
the sample often breaks without any noticeable deformation. Determining a flexural yield point is difficult for such materials. Therefore, in the case of brittle materials, it is not the onset of plastic deformation that is used as the strength parameter, but the onset of fracture when the maximum bending moment MB max is reached. This strength parameter is then called ultimate flexural strength or bending strength or modulus of rupture sigma FU. The bending strength is also determined using the formula already derived, although in the case of fracture there is no longer a linear stress distribution due to the plastic deformations. In particular, Hooke's law is no longer valid and the cross-section no longer remains even. The flexural strength is therefore a purely fictitious value which does not correspond to the true flexural stress in the material. In addition to the bending strength, the so-called fracture deflection Fmax can be determined for brittle materials, which indicates the maximum deflection of the specimen immediately before fracture. This value must of course always be considered in relation to the span L, since larger spans in principle mean larger deflections. A valid statement about the strength of brittle materials can usually be made better using the flexural test than using the tensile test. The reason for this is the distinct bending sensitivity when the specimen is clamped at an angle in the tensile test. In contrast to tough materials, a misalignment of brittle materials can almost not be compensated by deformation. Even when the specimen is slightly tilted, very high bending stresses occur, which cause the specimen to break prematurely due to the combined stress of tension and bending. The flexural test can therefore be more suitable than the tensile test for testing the strength of brittle materials, since the material is exposed to a pure bending load. However, this statement must be somewhat relativized, because although the three-point bending test is the most common, it has the disadvantage that in addition to the induced tensile and compressive forces, shear forces also act in the material. For this reason, the four-point flexural test was developed. The single loading pin is just substituted by a double pin. Between these points there is then a shear force-free range with a constant bending moment. Besides the strength parameters such as flexural yield point or flexural strength, the flexural test can also be used to determine the modulus of elasticity, also called Young's modulus. For this purpose, the dependence of the specimen deflection on the Young's modulus is used, provided that the deformation is purely elastic. Without going into detail about the bending theory of beams and its underlying assumptions, the elastic deflection of the center of a thin specimen is given by the shown equation. In this equation MB denotes the applied bending moment, L the span between the two supports, E the modulus of elasticity and I the already explained area moment of inertia of the specimen cross-section. Looking at the given equation it becomes apparent that the greater the product of material-dependent Young's modulus and geometry-dependent area moment of inertia, the less the specimen deflects. For this reason, this product is often referred to as bending stiffness B or flexural rigidity. The bending stiffness is neither a pure material nor a pure geometric parameter, but a specimen parameter. If the shown equation is solved for the modulus of elasticity, the Young's modulus can be determined as shown on the basis of the applied bending moment and the resulting deflection. With this relationship between Young's modulus and deflection, it is now also possible to determine the flexural strain already explained earlier. The general relationship between an applied stress and the resulting strain is obtained in the elastic range using the modulus of elasticity with the given equation. This equation is the basis for calculating the flexural strain. The flexural stress on the material surface is determined by the applied bending moment and the section modulus. The section modulus is in turn determined by the second area moment and the material thickness. The given formula for the Young's modulus can now be used in this equation. In this way, we finally obtain the formula already known for calculating the flexural strain. Note that this equation is only valid for elastic deformation. As already explained in detail, the stress distribution in the cross-section of a specimen subjected to elastic bending has a linear course, provided that Hooke's law applies. However, this changes when the flexural yield point is exceeded. For materials without strain hardening effects, the stress in the outer areas does not increase further when the yield point is exceeded. If the bending moment is increased further, the areas further inside are also only stressed to a maximum of the flexural yield point. The fictitious stress distribution, which generates the same bending moment as the actual stress distribution assuming a linear course, is shown as a dashed line. If the already known formula for calculating the flexural stress were used at this point, the result would refer to this linear stress distribution. The calculated flexural stress is therefore only a fictitious bending stress and does not correspond to the real stress.
In contrast to the material behavior just presented, for materials with strain hardening effect, the stress must be further increased when the yield point is exceeded in order to increase the deformation. As a result of the increase in hardening, the stress curve gradually flattens out from the point at which the yield strength is exceeded. However, the stress increases more strongly in the elastic area, but near the neutral axis there is still a linear stress distribution. In the extreme case of a fully plastic state, that is when theoretically the entire cross-section is deformed to a maximum extent, the stress distribution changes into a rectangular shape. In the case of plastic deformation, the stress is no longer distributed linearly over the cross-section. The bending equation derived on the assumption of a linear stress distribution can therefore no longer be used to determine the bending stress in the area of the surface. If this equation is nevertheless used to determine the stress values, the calculated fictitious stresses in the outer regions are greater than the actual stresses. Inside the sample, however, the calculated stresses are smaller than the stresses actually present. In particular, this means that the bending strength determined with the given bending equation is basically greater than the flexural stress actually present at fracture. If a partially plastically deformed specimen is unloaded in the flexural test, only the internal stresses act at this moment. This results in a corresponding spring back of the sample. Consequently, the internal stresses try to return the elastically deformed areas of the specimen to their original state, while the plastically deformed areas try to prevent this from happening. Even without external forces, stresses remain in the material, which are then referred to as residual stresses. Since the fictitious stress distribution is based on the validity of Hooke's law with its elastic deformation behavior, the residual stresses can be determined from the difference between the true stress and the fictitious stress. New neutral axes are formed which are neither subjected to tensile nor compressive load. Especially for gray cast iron, the stress distribution in the case of a bending load shows a special characteristic. For gray cast iron, the Young's modulus is not constant but depends on the stress. Hooke's law is no longer obeyed. Gray cast iron also reacts differently to a tensile load than to a compressive load. Gray cast iron can withstand compressive stresses to a much greater extent than tensile stresses. Accordingly, a different stress distribution will result, with overall higher compressive stress values than tensile stress values. Nevertheless, due to the static equilibrium, the compressive force resulting from the compressive stress distribution must be equal in magnitude to the tensile force which results from the tensile stress distribution. However, since the tensile stresses are at an overall lower level, they must therefore cover a larger cross-sectional area in order to meet the equilibrium. The unequal stress distribution therefore causes the neutral axis to shift from the geometric center of gravity of the cross-sectional area towards the area of compression.